Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce this morning's uh, Grand Round spe speaker, who frankly needs no introduction. Uh, we all know Dr. Mackey as a master clinician, scientist, and educator uh, that we all strive to emulate. Internationally, uh, he's widely recognized as the architect of modern hospital epidemiology and infection control. And this morning, uh, his timely presentation uh, will be on seasonal influenza. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be able to give another Grand Rounds. This is my 35th Grand Round in the last 44 years. I have no conflicts of interest. This is the centennial anniversary of the great epidemic of 1918. And I thought it would be very propitious to let you understand what a devastating event that was in world history, but how much we learned and how much we've been able to advance our understanding of influenza, which, as I'm going to show you, is a truly unique human infection. We're going to talk a little bit about the 1918 pandemic. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology and clinical features, diagnosis and treatment of flu, how we prevent flu. We'll spend a fair amount of time talking about the biology and molecular epidemiology of influenza and the molecular basis for virulence of influenza virus. And we are overdue for a pandemic with a highly variant 1918-like strain. But the preparation that's been undertaken now in the last 15 years has been extraordinary. And we're immensely, immensely better prepared than we were in 1918. And we'll talk a little bit, if we have time, about preparations for pandemic influenza with the super virulent strain. The 1918 pandemic was truly unique in modern history. It occurred in three waves. It first appeared in the spring of 1918. And in 1918, at a military base in Kansas, Fort Riley, in the space of several days, 1,100 soldiers came down with a flu-like illness. And flu was well-defined as a clinical syndrome going back 50 years. 38 of them died within hours to days. And it was very alarming. But although there was spread of flu to other bases and into the civilian sector, it really didn't have much of an impact. And there wasn't a great deal of excess mortality in the civilian population, although flu continued to occur throughout the spring and summer of 1918 and into the early fall. And one of the puzzling features of the 1918 epidemic was why it seems so mild throughout the spring and summer. It is rare to have flu in the spring or summer. We normally have no isolates of flu during that period of the year. In late September, early October of 1919, the world changed. It started in the military bases in the United States. Remember, we're at the peak of World War I, and we are sending literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers to France, the doughboys, uh, to fight the Germans in World War I. And on a base outside of Boston, Fort Devon, Camp Devon, Within 10 days, they had 10,500 cases of influenza. But that initial letter that I had list showing up there, if you read it, gives a little inkling of how devastating the virus had become. And within days, almost 2,000 of these healthy young soldiers died of influenza. It was just totally overwhelming. And this was the beginning of the great pandemic. Within weeks, there was massive influenza across the country, everywhere. Uh, at its peak in October, a thousand people a week were dying in Philadelphia. This is a temporary hospital that was set up. All of the health care facilities were overwhelmed. They were not nearly enough physicians or nurses, and many physicians and nurses were dying of influenza. 
It totally changed daily life in the United States. Ultimately, churches were closed, schools were closed, places of business were closed. People talked about this was the apocalypse. This was the end of the world at the current rate of death. They could project out in another six months there wouldn't be any people left. What was particularly frightening was how rapidly people could die. A man could go off to work, leaving his wife and children, and come home at night and find his wife dead. There's a apocryphal story of four elderly women who played bridge every week. And they got together and played bridge one night, and several of them said, I don't feel well. And the next morning, three of the four were dead of influenza. What was particularly striking about the great epidemic was that most flu epidemics tend to cause most of the mortality in the very young and the elderly. That's been the characteristic of most pandemic strains. Here, the largest number of deaths occurred in young people, 20 to 40, the healthiest people in society. In fact, less than 1% of all deaths occurred in people over 65 which was striking. Totally different. It was so desperate that they were running out of coffins and they were, build, they were burying people in mass graves. This is like the great plague of the 14th century. In World War I, they were not spared. About four to five times as many soldiers died of influenza during October as died on the battlefields of France at the height of World War I. And the armistice came in November, probably because the armies were running out of soldiers. It really probably was a major factor in why the Germans decided to capitulate. As quickly as the epidemic had killed huge numbers, by Christmas it had almost disappeared. It was over almost as fast as it started. And although there were scattered cases throughout the traditional flu year of January and February, in turned out that there was very little disease here and this was a third wave that occurred mainly in Europe. If you step back and saw the impact, it's estimated 50 to 100 million people died worldwide. And that figure has been really scrutinized in the last 20 years and is probably accurate. In the United States, it's estimated that up to 675,000 people died of flu. Today, that would be close to 2 million people died of flu, most of them in the month of October. That's just incomprehensible. Well, what is influenza? Why is it such a big deal? Influenza is a respiratory infection caused by a unique orthomyxovirus, influenza A or influenza B. And this is a unique virus that we've gained a huge amount of understanding about in my lifetime. It has only eight genes that hit eight strands of RNA, and it has these projections on the surface which allow it to bind to human cells to introduce its genome into the host cell, make lots of viruses very, very rapidly. And experimental studies have shown that literally once a person is infected, they are shedding virus within less than 24 hours. It, it's a very efficient infector uh, in a vulnerable patient. There's no virus that's probably had greater adaptability to Darwinian selective pressures and its capacity to survive and to thrive and to perpetuate its genome, which is the biologic drive of all living creatures. Influenza occurs in two forms, epidemics and pandemics. Type A is what we're going to spend our time talking about type B. It's got a very rapidly changing genome. It's the cause of epidemic and pandemic disease. Type B, we see each year is about maybe 20% of all of the infections. It's less severe, although it can kill. It's got a much more stable genome. Endemically, we have infection by strains that often have been circulating for decades. And the H3N2 strain, which appeared in 1968 as the second pandemic of the 20th century, has been circulating the globe now for over 40 years, almost 50 years. And 
in an average year, 10 to 30 percent of the population gets infected. A third of a million are hospitalized. There's up to 40,000 deaths. Most years, it's in the range of 20, 25,000 deaths, and it has a big economic cost, probably more than any other single virus. Pandemic disease, which we'll talk about, is a whole different ballgame because it's an entirely new strain. Generally, the whole world is vulnerable, and there's a much higher attack rate, many, many more deaths, and the cost can be huge. And it's estimated if we had a 1918-like epidemic, which would have a 3 to 5 percent mortality in vulnerable patients, we'd probably cost a trillion dollars to control it. Deaths in influenza are usually due to decompensation of underlying disease and or pneumonia. Individuals at risk of life-threatening disease traditionally have been the elderly, but that's changing in the last 20 years, as we're going to see. Residents in nursing homes, chronic disease, them. Native Americans and indigenous peoples are very, very vulnerable to influenza, much more likely to be complicated or fatal. Chronic metabolic disease, cardiopulmonary disease, immunosuppression. We've learned in the last 10 to 15 years that morbid obesity and second and third trimester pregnancy are risk factors for much more severe disease. It used to be that almost all of the deaths in influenza occurred in the elderly. That is changing, as we're going to see. Now, why does, path of, why does influenza kill? And it is an infection, primarily the respiratory tract. It does not have receptors that allow it to bind to other tissues as a rule and does not cause a viremia. This virus has an enormous capacity to trigger an inflammatory response. And the illness that we see, the fever, the headache, the achiness, are directly related to the cytokine storm that's released by influenza. And there's very few human viruses other than the hemorrhagic fever viruses that trigger more of a cytokine storm than does influenza A. This has been very well characterized. But influenza does something else. This is a volunteer when they used to allow conscientious objectors to participate in ex medical experiments. And this volunteer said, I'll let you infect me with influenza. And so they did a bronchoscopy and they biopsied his tracheal bronchomyocosa at time zero. Then they infected him by dripping live influenza A virus into his nose. Three days later, he was having second thoughts about allowing him to do this. And they did another bronchoscopy and a biopsy, and there's his mucosa. It takes a month to two months to regenerate the ciliated epithelium. And during this period of time, even an Olympic athlete can be vulnerable to bacterial pneumonia because we all aspirate a little bit at night. Influenza causes many complications, the most common of which are pneumonia and sinusitis. But we can have decompensation of stable pulmonary cardiac disease, viral myocarditis. This is very well defined. It's rare, but it's very well defined. Fortunately, most people recover. We can have a parainfectious encephalitis or Guillain-Barre syndrome, rhabdomyolysis. The most common cause of rhabdomyolysis in the community if it's not due to trauma or marked metabolic aberrations such as hypokalemia or hypophosphatemia is influenza A. Clearly causes fetal abnormalities with first trimester infection. And there's a three to four fold increased risk of myocardial infarction or stroke, ischemic stroke, in the weeks after acute influenza infection. It's been very well characterized just in the last five years. And it can cause full blown organ failure like gram negative septic shock in many patients. In terms of pneumonia, this study during the pandemic of 68, the H3N2 pandemic, showed huge numbers of people coming into the emergency department at Grady Hospital in downtown Atlanta with flu. About a week to two weeks later, they had a big surge of people admitted with bacterial pneumonia. And this let us understand that bacterial pneumonia is a very important complication of influenza. It tends to occur after about five days of influenza, and it's usually a focal pneumonia, and a gram stain will usually show organisms will culture the organism. The feared pneumonia influenza is primary pneumonia, which tends to occur in individuals with underlying disease, pregnancy, or obesity. It's early, 
They get a diffuse interstitial alveolar infiltration. It looks like pulmonary edema. It is. It's non-cardiogenic inflammatory pulmonary edema. And these patients have traditionally had a very high mortality in the range of 60 to 80 percent. But that is changing, as we'll see. And if you look at the microscopic appearance of the tracheal secretions, it's scant, it's thin, and there are no organisms seen. Diagnosis of influenza clinically starts off with realizing that during the flu season, cough, fever, headache, sore throat, myalgia, is a good chance that's flu. In fact, in adults, this has been very well studied. If during a flu season, there's lots of flu in the community, you have a new cough, you've got fever, and this has come on in within 48 hours, it's almost 80% likely that it's flu. Trying to diagnose flu in children by clinical features is a dismal effort. It doesn't work. Laboratory diagnosis is the name of the game. We have culture, which has been around for 50 years. It's pretty good, but it takes three to five days at best. We have point of care rapid antigen tests now. These are uh, usually uh, DFA or they are uh, enzyme immunoassay tests. A lot of people think that they're 90, 100% sensitive. They're not. They're lacking. The point of care color change tests are probably at best 50, 60% sensitive. The enzyme immunoassay, which goes to a lab and they actually quantify the amount of reaction, are about 80% sensitive. But they're specific. PCR is the name of the game. And I simply won't rely on an antigen test with a clinical patient who likely has flu. A PCR is really the name of the game. And this is this is a beautiful paper in the Annals, which looks at all the published studies of flu, and this is based on that, that, stuff, that paper. Drug therapy of flu has been around for almost 50 years, and it started with the M2 channel inhibitors, amantadine or imantadine. These drugs were very effective up until the early 2000s, when almost overnight we had high-level resistance appeared in strains all over the world probably related to the use of these drugs for prevention of flu in food birds, in chickens and turkeys in Asia. Uh, because bird flu is a big deal if you raise food birds. And you can lose your whole flock very quickly. So they were feeding these birds amantadine, and the, the, the price paid was high-level resistance globally. The neuraminidase is a very important enzyme that the virus needs to be able to infect. And about 20 years ago, we got a class of drugs called neuraminidase inhibitors. And they are highly effective in terms of inhibiting replication of the virus. We have two forms. We have a form that is inhaled. There's an oral tablet. And the inhaled form can cause bronchospasm. And it's really not gained much uh, use in clinical practice. The oral form tends to cause nausea or vomiting in some people. but these drugs should be used, they're maximized by earliest therapy. Once you get beyond 48 to 72 hours, unless the patient has life-threatening flu, it's probably unlikely you're going to have much impact. They're indicated for all high-risk seasons or the flu season with probable acute flu. If you get them within 48 hours, especially if it's laboratory confirmed, all persons exposed, especially in nursing homes or families, exposed healthcare workers, all high-risk patients, if there's a new highly virulent strain. How well do they work? There have been four very good scholarly meta-analyses of the randomized trials. And there's between 30 and 40 randomized trials of these drugs in clinical practice. What we know, they shorten symptomatic illness one day. However, they reduce shedding by about three days, probably reduce the spread. They reduce bacterial low respiratory infection and reduce hospitalization. Prophylaxis. If a family member has flu and you put all the other members on prophylaxis, or if a nursing home has one or two cases, you put everybody in the nursing home on prophylaxis, it's almost 90% effective. For treatment of hospitalized patients who are likely to get sicker or even die, it reduces mortality about prevent flu? Well, there are personal measures covering your nose, mouth, and tissue. Our mother taught us this, but we don't do it very consistently. 
Try not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Wash your hands often, especially after you cough or sneeze. And you can use a hand cleanser. I personally prefer to use the bleach pads, which are far more effective in killing almost all viruses. You get flu, stay home, because you're a risk to patients and to your colleagues. What about the role of masks in flu? They're probably more effective than we appreciate. This is a very interesting and nice study done, a cluster randomized trial in 154 households where they had an index case of flu. And they randomized the use of face masks by all of the family members within enhanced hand hygiene if they could implement it within 36 hours of the diagnosis of a case of flu versus simply standard precautions. They reduce transmission of PCR confluent by two-thirds. That's not quite as good as oseltamivir, but that's pretty darn good. Uh, in many Asian countries, masking is ubiquitous during the entire flu year, as we'll see. What about a vaccine? We've had a kill flu vaccine now for almost 50 years, and we selectively used it until about 10 to 15 years ago. It is now a universal vaccine. And it's high priority for all pregnant women and children and all healthcare workers where it should be mandatory. Does it work? Early studies were case control studies that suggested that there was a benefit with flu vaccine. But in the last 10 to 15 years, we are now getting randomized controlled trials. And here's the most recent scholarly meta-analysis came from Wisconsin, Ed Melangia at the Marshall Clinic, who's a very distinguished influenza researcher, where they've shown that on average, the pooled vaccine efficacy is highest for B or H1N1. It's poorest for H3N2 strains. In 2004-05, we planned to give 110 million doses, but 50 million doses were found to be contaminated. We acquired some ultimately from Europe, but vaccine administration was late and had to be prioritized. Why? Why couldn't we just call up and say, send us another 50 million doses. We'd like it within a week. Because making flu vaccine, which is done in emanated eggs, takes six to nine months to make the 100 to 150 million doses that we give each year in the United States. It's a long, laborious process from choosing the strains that are going to be in next year's vaccine at least nine months ahead of time. They are then tested, are they immunogenic? Then, if they are immunogenic in animal models, are they safe? They test it in volunteers. The FDA has to prove it. This is a long, laborious process. And if we're lucky, we get flu vaccine by late September most years. We better need a better system, which we'll talk about. What about the biology and molecular epidemiology of influenza? Why are there annual epidemics of flu every winter? Why can we get infected multiple times in a lifetime? I've been infected five times in my lifetime by influenza. I was extremely sick in the 1957 Asian flu outbreak of H1N1. I was so sick, I was in high school, and I was delirious. I was incontinent. And what my mother tells me, a 17-year-old, I was really sick. And growing up in a little tiny town in northern Wisconsin, uh, my parents didn't even, wouldn't have even thought about taking me to a doctor. I was lucky I survived. A lot of people died. 70,000 Americans died in that year. That would be equivalent of about 200,000 dying today. So why can we get reinfected? I've gotten H3N2. I got it in 68. I got it two more times since that time. I'm convinced my final fatal illness will be influenza. <laughs> why do we have pandemics of flu every 20, 30, or 40 years. Well, if we look at this virus, there are, there are two essential structures on the virus that are essential for infection. And there are the hemagglutinin, which is essential for binding to sialic residues on the surface of the host cell and allowing the virus access to the cell where it takes off and starts making new virus. And the neuraminidase allows the virus to break off and to disperse and spread and infect contiguous cells. Both of these structures have to be functional for a virus to be able to cause infection. 
immunity is governed in part by antibody to these antigens, especially the hemagglutinin. Intraepidemic annual epidemics are due to what's called antigenic drift. This virus, like all RNA viruses, has a very high rate of mutation, errors, and this is for an environmental, this is Darwinian advantage. Although it mutates a lot, it's going to develop new strains that have better fitness to be able to infect and to persist. And every year, there's about a 2 or 3 percent mutation in the genome of the virus. Uh, and over a cumulative period of five, six, seven years, you are now vulnerable again, and you need to get the annual vaccine that is more closely aligned to the structure of the, of the virus that's currently circulating. And each year, we have our annual flu epidemic, and the big upsurge is what we call the epidemic. I think that's excessive. This is simply the winter endemic, but nonetheless, this is the epidemic, annual epidemic of flu. And this has its consequences that we've discussed. The next question is, why do we have pandemics every 30 to 40 years? Global pandemics are due to an antigenic shift. This is due to an entirely new hemagglutinin, neuraminidase, or both. What we now know is influenza afflicts a wide variety of mammals and birds. And there are strains of flu that are unique to cattle, to seals, to cats, dogs, horses, ferrets, pigs. And it turns out that the most important are birds. Bird influenza virus is probably the mother of all species influenza strains. And if we look at the characterization of the hemagglutinins, uh, human strains, these are have been identified in human infection. They're all matched by bird strains or swine strains, but not by horse or other species. Same thing applies to the neuromendides. And it turns out that human influenza is the quintessential recombinant virus, which invariably has genes from avian strains, from swine strains. And swine are called the mixing vessel because they are able, they have surface configuration of their silic acid residues on their surface that can be infected by both bird strains and human strains. We have a alpha-2-6 configuration, and most bird strains cannot infect with that configuration. However, in mixing in the pig, we can evolve strains that infect humans. So that human influenza viruses are human, bird, swine recombinants. The largest number of strains have been come out of Asia, where we have the largest population of food, birds, pigs, and humans in close proximity, often living under the same roof. And when we have a major shift, we have a new recombinant strain that has the capacity to infect humans and can be spread efficiently human to human, we get a pandemic. And when that occurs, the number of cases surges many, many times higher than the annual epidemic. There have been four pandemics in the 20th century. The Great Epidemic of 1918, the Asian Epidemic of 1957-58, which killed a lot of people, the 68-69 Hong Kong flu epidemic, which killed 35,000 in 68-69, and 2009 and 10, we had a fourth pandemic with a unique H1N1 strain, which we're going to see is different from that 1918 strain. 2009-2010 swine flu outbreak started in the spring. It behaved very much like 1918, and it scared the public health people all to death. They were scared it was going to be another 1918 epidemic because it appeared in the spring. There was lots of flu in February and March, and it had flu cases all summer, and it peaked in September and November. But then it disappeared by late 2008, 2009, very much like the 1918 strain. But it was very unique. It was different than anything we'd seen in the previous 50 years. Mexico, 
may have been the origin. They had a lot of cases early on. CDC, WHO led a collaborative and intensive multinational effort to intensify global surveillance, make a PCR widely available, develop, manufacture adequate vaccine, and ensure sufficient oseltamivir. In the United States, there was unprecedented cooperation between CDC, NIH, FDA, the state health departments, all the professional societies, and it was very effective. It really enormously advanced our capacity to prevent influenza. They quickly determined that this new strain did not, it was a recombinant that had North American swine genes, North American avian genes, the old seasonal H3N2 that had already been around for 30 years, and it had some European swine lineage genes. It did not have the virulence genes of the 1918 strain. There was expedited vaccine development, and there was enough vaccine around that they were able to start vaccine by early October. This had unique clinical features. Nearly all cases, most deaths were in young people. This was very unique. Here the median age in this first publication in the New England Journal is 20. Far fewer cases in the elderly. If we look at deaths, 80% of the deaths were in individuals under the age of 65. GI symptoms were very common early on. That's reflecting influenza in birds is a GI disease. Pregnancy and obesity were associated with severe disease. And that led to enormous amount of research on pregnancy and influenza, showing that pregnant women were five times more likely to die. And in the first trimester, it caused congenital abnormalities, killed vaccines were safe, they were effective, and every pregnant woman had to be immunized against flu, a national priority. Pregnant women need to be aware they could be at risk and have access to getting treated with oseltamivir, which was very safe, very quickly if they developed a flu-like syndrome. It should not be delayed. And if it started early, they showed there was less severe disease and fewer deaths. Unique clinical features include the fact that Australia and the Southern Hemisphere has their flu normally in the summer. So the strains that are causing pandemic disease or at least epidemic disease in Australia, gives us a little snapshot of what's to come for us in the northern hemisphere in fall. And they had severe flu, and they had a lot of severe pneumonia in young people. And they started using ECMO. I was doing a visiting professorship in August at Prince Alfred Hospital in downtown Sydney, and they, I was rounding in the ICU, and they took me to a wing of the ICU where seven consecutive obese women were on ECMO. And they had been on, maintained on ECMO for severe, severe pneumonia, hypoxemic respiratory failure for seven to ten days already at that point in time. Their published experience, they showed 80% of the people they put on ECMO for severe pneumonia survived. It totally changed the landscape in critical care around the world. ECMO is now a viable alternative to save the lives of people who have refractory hypoxemic respiratory failure. The overall mortality was not what was feared. It was about 25,000 people died, but there was a disproportionate mortality in children. In an average year, about 50 children under the age of 8 will die of flu each year. In 2009-10, 282 children were identified as having died of influenza, pointing up that we've got to immunize children, a very high public health priority. What about 2017-18? Well, this is a bad year. If we compare with the previous influenza years, much, much more influenza in the community, but it looks like it's starting to die down. It's an H3N2 year, very little H1N1, and as a consequence, the vaccine has not been very effective. Each year, flu vaccines are about, on average, maybe 40 to 50 percent effective. Uh, for H3N2 strains, which is a majority, it's only about 25% effective. Much, much better for H1N1, much better in children, much better in children, poor in elderly adults. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any excess number of deaths in children, anything like 2009 or 10. We've got around, I think, 35 or 40 thus far. 
Why is influenza virus so virulent? Why was the 1918 strain, and why is the H5N1 strain that's killing large numbers of people in Asia so virulent? And if we look at the relative mortality of most strains, the mortality in most strains is about 0.1% or less. Uh, there's an Asian strain that we're going to talk about that has a very high mortality, and it's estimated worldwide about 2.5% of people died of influenza. However, I point out that indigenous peoples, uh, entire villages in Alaska were wiped out. Entire villages wiped out. And in India, it's estimated 20% of people who got influenza died. Samoa had a 20 to 30% mortality of influenza. So why was this strain so virulent? All virologists hungered to get the 1918 strain to study, to sequence the genome, to understand what was unique about it. But there was no 1918 strain around. And people said, why don't we go into the Arctic where they bury people in the permafrost? And Johann Halton was a pathologist who, for his PhD thesis, he did this study. He got permission to go to Brevik Mission in Alaska uh, and uh, it turned out that of the city of 80 people, 72 died of flu. And they were buried in the permafrost. And he got permission to exhume one body. She looks like she was buried yesterday. This, she was buried over 50 years before this picture was taken. So she was frozen in the permafrost. They got specimens from lung from other tissues that they brought back for study. To make a long story short, they did not get vi live viable virus, but they got plenty of RNA. And they were able to actually sequence the entire gene of at least four to five of the influenza 1918 strain. And they could synthesize the strands, introduce them into a cell culture. They could reconstruct the 1918 strain in the lab under high precautions. And they could then have a strain to study. What was unique about it? They could study it in animal models. And a lot of this work uh, was done. Uh, Dr. Carl Woka, who is a professor on our campus, one of the most distinguished basic influenza investigators in the world, probably the most distinguished basic researcher in flu in the world, was a very integral part of a lot of this research. It first of all showed that these strains infected lung cells efficiently. Most flu strains do not infect lung. These strains had a very unique capacity to infect lung in experimental models. It was able to affect efficiently in the absence of trypsin. It could use any ubiquitous protease around because the hemagglutinin needs to be cleaved to be maximally functional. So it was very adaptable. But what was most striking was the cytokine response that was triggered. It was massive, a massive cytokine response, triggering genes that caused apoptosis of nematocytes. It caused hemorrhagic pulmonary edema in the ferret and in the mouse models. And they were able to show a tremendous outpouring of immunoinflammatory cells. Virulence factors appear to be linked to the H1 or H5 hemagglutinin genes. More recent studies suggest that probably a third of the people that died of flu had secondary bacterial pneumonia as well in an era before we had any antibiotic therapy. What about the overdue global threat of a new pandemic that could be devastating, a super virulent strain? This is not simply fanciful musing on the part of public health people to get more support from the government. I point out to you that in Asia, as we speak right now today, there's a strain of influenza, H5N1, that is a avian strain. And it has killed hundreds of millions of food birds, chickens, turkeys. When they get an outbreak in a population, the government comes in, they destroy all of them, they burn the carcasses, and bury the residue deep. And these, this is a very virulent strain for all bird species. There have been nearly a thousand cases of influenza throughout Asia. 
the majority of them have actually been in Egypt, interestingly, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the mortality where the average age is 13 years is 52%. This is a super virulent strain. A mutation of one amino acid could potentially allow this strain to be able to infect humans efficiently. There's been very, very little person-to-person -person spread. There's another strain circulating in China, H7N9, almost as virulent, and there have been 1,500 cases as of January 25th that have been reported. In both of these strains, it's bird exposures. There's been documented person-to-person -person transmission, but this is probably genetic vulnerability to infection by these strains. You have the wrong configuration of your sialic acid residues on your cells. These strains can infect all birds, and remember, birds fly long distances, very long distances. Some of these birds can fly from Asia through the Bering Straits all the way down to the United States. And if we look at H5N1, the fact that it's spread as far as Egypt and the Middle East, Indonesia, tells you that birds have transmitted this strain very widely. What are our preparations for pandemic influenza? Well, it's national, regional, and locally. This is a famous aphorism that's 500 years old. It's an ill wind that blows no good. And nowhere do I think that this is more applicable than 911. One of the great tragedies in our country's history. 911 was followed within days by somebody sending weaponized anthrax to the U.S. mails. These two events made us realize we are very vulnerable and we had literally no preparation for terrorism. We had no preparation for bioterrorism. We were totally vulnerable. It was stunning. This triggered an enormous amount of interest at the federal level that we had to prepare. And more monies were allocated to public health during the five years that followed 911 that probably had occurred in the previous 25 or 30. And not only preparing for terrorism, but preparing for bioterrorism. And preparing for bioterrorism is new emerging infectious disease threats. You can't prepare for bioterrorism if you don't prepare for natural infectious disease pandemics. And this resulted in a very comprehensive plan for pandemic influenza, which came out in 2006 and has been updated annually since that time. Starting with intensified surveillance, we now do global surveillance for flu in over 50 countries, coordinated by WHO and CDC. And if a new potentially pandemic strain appears, it'll probably be picked up fairly early, far, far earlier than if we're relying solely on passive surveillance. And this has been a major advance in control of influenza. Vaccine development. There's been an enormous interest in developing new vaccines. What we desperately need is a universal vaccine that targets molecular sites on the virus that are conserved, that do not mutate like the hemagglutinin or the neuraminidase. And there's been quite a bit of progress on that. There are now vaccines that have been developed in tissue cultures where you can make it much faster, much more quickly than in embryonated eggs that look to be as good as egg-based vaccines. And I think that these new tissue culture vaccines will very likely become the standard within several years. Expanded research into antivirals. We need what is the next generation antiviral drug. And research, a tremendous focus on vaccine research and on new drugs. What about at the local level? Uh, at the local level, we need to strengthen our communications, and this has improved enormously. I served on federal and local task forces in the early 2000s after 911, and I can tell you the computer systems locally didn't talk to the state very well, the state ones didn't talk with the feds very well, and the communication left a huge amount to be desired. That has been rectified 
on a massive scale. And our public health efforts now are very well integrated uh, locally, statewide, and federally at the present time. Effective infection control programs in hospitals and surveillance, hand hygiene, enough protective apparel, prompt deployment of isolation, ample airborne isolation rooms, protocols. What about UW hospitals? In the early 2000s, we realized we needed to be prepared for bioterrorism, such as smallpox, uh, or anthrax, or hemorrhagic fever viruses, which was fear about, or for pandemic influenza. And to the credit of the hospital administration at the time, uh, Gordon Durzon was the CEO of the hospital, there was a commitment to dedicate one entire unit in the hospital as a potential emerging pathogens surge capacity unit. If we look at this unit, this is showing you the unit. One whole wing was committed, was a self-contained ICU, was electrified, put all the, the tubing in for oxygen, for everything we need for an ICU. This wing can be converted to an eight-bed self-contained ICU very quickly. It has its own nursing station, self-contained pharmacy, and had separate roof line exhaust for the unit, could be set at negative pressure. This was a 30-plus uh, bed, 36-bed emerging pathogens unit. As I told you about 10 years ago, I was a consultant to the government of Singapore on infection control in hospitals. And I went there during their flu season. And Singapore is a very interesting country. It was a very, very impressive country. I've been there a number of times before and since, but that they took me, I saw all their major hospitals, visited the hospitals, did a number of uh, special seminars for infection control personnel across the country. Uh, but they had their flu season, and I saw what they did for flu. I knew they had controlled SARS. The SARS outbreak would hit Asia with a bang and was killing huge numbers of people. The Singaporeans realized very quickly we're seeing SARS. This is highly contagious. Physicians, nurses are comprising more than half the cases. They're getting infected. In 10 days, they built a 25-bed SARS hospital one block from their main university hospital in downtown Singapore. Totally self-contained, air control. People stayed and lived in that unit for up to two weeks at a time. And they control SARS very, very effectively by doing that. Well, in Singapore, I found on a street corner, they had a walk-in flu unit. If you thought you weren't feeling good, you could walk in, you could be swabbed. If you were positive, they gave you, they gave you oseltamivir. If you hadn't been immunized, they'd immunize you. Every hospital in Singapore has a negative pressure isolation unit of up to 40 beds, 24 ICU beds in each major hospital. They do thermographic screening of everybody entering the hospital during the flu season. And this has been validated. This is pretty good. It's about 80 to 90% sensitive. If you've got a fever, you'll be picked up by thermography. And if when I went to visit a hospital, I had to go through the thermographic screening. And if I had been positive, they wouldn't let me enter. They would have taken me aside. They would have swabbed me. They would have tested me. And if I was positive, they would have sent me home. But I wasn't going to get in. All workers, all families, everybody. They do 24-7 monitoring of healthcare workers for flu-like illness. You talk to every day. Or you have flu-like symptoms. If you do, you get swabbed, and you'll probably be sent home. They do universal masking in all hospitals and the clinic during the flu season. People are wearing masks all the time. And they believe that this helped contain spread of SARS. They feel it reduces spread of influenza. I think they're right. We've come a long ways in my lifetime. In the last 50 years since I finished medical school, we've gone from basically cultures is all we had for diagnosis. Virtually nobody was immunized on a regular scale. And we had no antivirals. 
to having vaccines, effective treatments, highly accurate, rapid diagnosis, and well-oiled local, national, and international programs for containment of influenza and for prevention of pandemic disease. Thank you very much. Yes. A little louder. Is there a role for prophylactic antibiotics once a patient has bacterial antibiotics once a patient If they're hospitalized, are you saying, or if you diagnose flu in the community? Either one. If you diagnose flu in the community, no. You evaluate the person, and a test that I think is vastly underutilized that's very, very helpful is a C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein should not go up much at all with isolated viral infection. If it goes up to one or two, normally zero or one, if it goes up to one or two or three, it's very unlikely a patient has bacterial infection. But if they get a bacterial sinusitis or they have an early pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, your CRP almost invariably jumps up very quickly. And uh, I do CRPs routinely in the virtual ICU, the EICU at night, because we see a lot of flu-like illness. And it's been very, very helpful. And uh, uh, I think that's a test that I would get to help me. If you patient, uh, if you hear sounds on the chest, or they're coughing a lot, they've got a fever, I would get a chest radiograph because they may have pneumonia. And uh, so that if you have a good likelihood of bacterial infection by evaluation in a clinical setting, yes, you treat. I don't look on that as prophylactic. Prophylactic antibiotics, and everybody's got flu, have not been shown to be uh, effective. It's not been demonstrated. Studies were done almost 40 years ago for viral respiratory infections. Does it, does it reduce hospitalizations or make a difference? In the hospital setting, again, we evaluate the patient who comes in. Most patients who are admitted with flu come in with pneumonia, the vast majority of pneumonia. And we know that it's going to be bacterial pneumonia probably three quarters to 90% of the time. And the answer is most of those patients are going to be put on therapeutic antibiotics. They have radiographic or other features of pneumonia, and it's mostly bacterial pneumonia. If it looks like a influenza pneumonia and they're very sick and they're in the TLC and they're in hypoxemic respiratory failure on a ventilator, uh, we can get a deep tracheal aspirate or get a bronchial viral lavage and can fairly accurately determine whether there's secondary bacterial infection. Most of these patients, by the time they get to the TLC, have already been started on empiric antibiotics. Yes? Is there any evidence that the COVID immunity... A little louder. Uh, is there any evidence that uh, an individual that gets repetitive immune immunizations has some immunity? Is there a cumulative effect from immunization? Yeah. The answer is probably. Probably. There probably is. I guess I, a, a follow-up question to that is, so for, no, for instance, you know, for the H1N1 flu epidemic of 2009-10, a lot of the younger individuals were preferentially infected. And so is, is that thought to be something about the virus or the fact that it just wasn't out? Anti- no, it's probably, there have been H1N1 strains circulating in low level for the last 50 years. They've usually been a very small fraction of the, all of this influenza. But over a cumulative lifetime, 65, you could very well get infected with one of those strains. And probably most elderly people, that study showed probably close to 50% of elderly people had some pre-existing antibody to H1N1, which was not the case in younger. Good question. 
because early influenza basically can be like a cold. But very quickly, the congestion is associated with a severe sore throat, and you start to get a headache, you get myalgias and fever, but early on there's no way of knowing, and so if somebody solely has nasal congestion, they think it's probably a cold, I'm not troubled by them putting on a mask and coming in. But I think during flu season, if there's any possibility you could have flu, you start to cough with your congestion, or you've got a little fever, you have a moral obligation to be tested and to not expose patients until it has been determined. If you get a PCR and it's negative, the negative predictive value is very high. And I think you probably are not going to pose a risk. But on the other hand, you may carry RSV. Uh, you may carry parainfluenza, which can be devastating for immunocompromised patients, as can RSV. So it, it's, it's a difficult question. I frankly think that uh, individuals who during the flu season who develop a respiratory illness should have a low threshold to get themselves tested. And it should ideally be PCR. Our labs now do PCRs every day. They run them. Uh, it's not a every three days or once a week kind of a test. And PCR it, during the flu season should be done almost as a stat test in my opinion, particularly in the outpatient setting where it's, it's so valuable. There have been a number of new antivirals that are in testing. One old antiviral we've had around for a long time that's got pretty good in vitro activity against influenza is ribavirin. It's not been studied very well, and I suspect if we had massive oseltamivir resistance, suddenly we had a pandemic and it was resistant to oseltamivir, which is not incomprehensible, we would start giving a lot of ribavirin to the uh, high-risk people who are getting infected. Uh, but uh, um, I don't know which one you might be referring to. Uh, none of these has come to the uh, studies in large, large numbers of patients. Um, but I think we're getting closer. Yes? That's a very good question. Uh, my surprise has never been studied. I personally take two doses of flu vaccine every year. <laughs> I've been doing that for a long time. Well, it's a, it's a legitimate concern. I, I, I seem to be uniquely vulnerable. And number one, number two, we know that if you get your flu vaccine in late September, early October, by January, February, when there's often a lot of flu activity, your titers may be pretty low. And that's why I take a second dose in January. I've been doing that for a number of years. I can't advocate that for everybody. It's not been studied. It's not been proven. But I've been sort of surprised that CDC has not done commissioned studies to, stud to examine that question. It's an important question. Uh, it's hard enough getting people immunized once. It's hard enough getting small children immunized twice, which you need to do, let alone getting the entire population immunized twice. I suspect that's why. Thank you very much.